Today's lecture will be our robotics overview. It's important to understand that this course was designed for everyone from a novice roboticist to an expert roboticist, from someone who's never touched a robot or someone who did first robotics in high school or bot ball or vex robotics or is on the Rose Home and Robotics team. So because we have a spectrum of skill sets in here, we have to start from the fundamentals. This course always starts with an introduction to robotics history, state of the art, because I want this class to be more than about tinkering with a toy. I want you to understand something about the technical aspects of robotics as well as the theoretical foundations. So the objectives of Lecture 1-1 Robotics Overview is to define and describe a robot as well as the field of robotics, to define artificial intelligence, to describe the three robot primitives and their relationship to robot control, to describe the three robotic paradigms, there's actually a few more, but we'll focus on those for this lecture, and to list the seven main areas of artificial intelligence. One of the first things I always talk about in this course is robot care. I want you to treat my robot like it was your baby. My robots are very important to me. That means if you're testing the robot on a table, you put it on a test stand. If you're testing the robot on the floor, you make sure of where you're stepping and that it doesn't get in the way of other people walking. It is also very important that if anything goes wrong with the robot, please don't take my robot apart. Take it to the technicians and let them fix it. Don't attach anything to the robot. Don't try to rewire the robot. Students always want to change my robot because they can build a better bot. But in this case, my robots are very important to me. They cost a lot of money. Money doesn't grow on trees, etc., etc. So please take care of my robot. I always show the following video as in a demonstration of what not to do with my robot. This is not an endorsement for Bud Light, I must say. It is just a demonstration of what not to do with my robots. Warning, this is not a programming class. However, programming is a prerequisite for this class and programming is an integral part of this course. You cannot give a robot intelligence without writing software for a robot. The best way to learn to program in any language is to practice, practice, practice. The best reference for Arduino Sketch is Arduino website and see as a programming re reference is also available on the online MSDN library. I suggest you use online resources as well as your lab partner and your classmates to help you learn to code, to learn to properly write code, to learn to properly comment code. I will talk a lot about that when we start doing lab. Remember, if you cannot program well, the best way to get better is to practice, practice, practice. Choose your lab partner wisely. I highly recommend multidisciplinary teams so that each of you brings your strongest skill set to the team. I always like to show a video of some of the robot labs from prior years so that you can get some kind of idea of what kind of things we do in this class. I know you've probably had friends that took the class and they probably told you the pros and cons of whichever robot platform we were using at the time or how difficult this class could be, but I like for you to see firsthand some of the things we do. So this is Molly and this was the Rosebot that we used last year and I'll just show you a little bit of the AI that was developed for Molly.
So I always like to talk a little bit about um, how I got my start in robotics. So I have a master's degree in controls from Wayne State University, which is in downtown Detroit, Michigan. And I did controls because I was working as a controls engineer at the time. So I did programming of the industrial robots. Back then they were KUKA robots and we used something called Corel robot language. And I also did PLC programming and we had Allen Bradley PLCs that were programmed using ladder logic. When I got to Vanderbilt, my PhD was more focused on mobile robotics and in particular human robot interfaces and human robot interaction, which is called HRI. So in this HRI research, what I did was to, to develop an intuitive user interface that tried to consolidate various types of sensor data into an intuitive display that someone who was a novice user could then use in order to teleoperate a robot that was somewhere in a remote location. This was called supervisory control or shared control. So what you see here on the left is the user interface that I designed. This robot had sonar, it had camera images, it had laser. Um, the user also had um, camera feedback, it had a map of the environment, and it had the individual displays for the laser, the sonar, um, a compass, which you can't really see because it's cut off on this image. And then it had something that I designed along with some of my classmates called a sensory ego sphere, which is the bottom left. What a sensory ego sphere does is the ego or the center of it is the robot. And everything the robot needs to know about its world is around it in a sphere. This was developed by Jim Albus, and it's a way of representing robot knowledge. So this sphere was meant to be searchable. It was meant to be intuitive so that I could give the robot directions instead of going two meters forward and turn right 90 degrees and move forward three meters. I could say navigate to the pink cone by going past the orange and the green or navigate until you sense a wall and then make a left at the red cone, etc. So it was meant to give the robot information that the user could then use to give more intuitive type directional information. We don't do a lot of HRI in this course. We are going to read a literature review paper on it, but I just wanted you to see a little bit about what kind of work I did as my robotics research to get exposure into this field.